Hi, I'm Jessica Brown from the Centre for Independent Studies and I'm here with Peter Carlyle. He's an associate at Hawker Britain and adjunct associate professor at the Centre for International Security Studies at the University of Sydney. Peter, welcome to Concilium. Thank you, Jessica. Now, you were here to talk about the Middle East. You started your talk by saying that you were in Egypt earlier this year yeah. when some of the uprisings were, were beginning. Can you tell us what the vibe was like? What was the mood like? You could actually feel the, the tension amongst the people uh, and, you know, walking around the streets. And I speak the language, so it was, it was easy to sort of get a sense of uh, what people were thinking about their politics and, and the level of frustration that mm. existed was, it was actually palpable, it was actually the, this tension in the air. Um, there was some early protests in, in January after a, a suicide bombing mm -hmm. over New Year's Eve, which killed 22 people and, and people were very angry. Mm. Um, and they were out in the streets and, and you, could, you could get that sense of anger and frustration, but it wasn't an anger which, and proven right here, it wasn't an anger that erupted into, into a violent mm. uprising or a, Islamic type sort of uprising. It was an anger which sort of translated into a sort of democratic uh, or call for de democracy and a call for freedom in a, in a peaceful, non-violent way, which was fantastic. And um, I think surprised, you know, people all over the world that, that, that it worked out that way. Do you think there's a sense that these are individual struggles or do people feel like they're part of a broader wave of of uprisings across the Middle East? Oh, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a feeling amongst the Middle East, people across the Middle East, that this is something that they all share. Yep. But each country is different. Um, and in fact, uh, the circumstances in each of the countries that have undergone mm -hmm. this transformation and, and these up, this upheaval has been quite different, different circumstances. Um, and Egypt is also a bit different than the others because uh, it's been a nation state for actually thousands of years. Mm. And, not, not artificial in the sense that some of these other countries are. So you get that national nationalist sentiment there as well, uh, which is important. Uh, but certainly people feel very proud mm. uh, that, that finally, after 30 years or more of, of oppression and, and, and inability to express themselves freely, that the whole world was looking at them in a positive light mm. rather than a, a, a negative way. You talked about just the, the corruption, the absolutely pervasive corruption within Egypt. How much did this have to do with, with the oh, uprising? Big part of it, uh, really a big part of it because many young people, um, educated young people, felt unable to achieve things based on their merit, uh, based on their, their education they'd received. Everything had to be done through someone you, you knew mm. or through some sort of bribery, just to get anything happening, you also had to grease the wheels by, by paying people off. And it was, it's, you, you could tell people who just had enough of this because they felt so constrained and stifled in being able to start up businesses or, or, or have success that didn't rely on, you know, having to pay someone off in the government or within the, uh, the ruling party. So I think the endemic corruption had a, a big part to play, play uh, there. but. It, w there were other issues that combined with that. There was the oppressive or repressive police state where people could have been locked up arbitrarily mm. and tortured and so on. There was the, um, the this issue of the youth bulge, the demographic there was that there was a lot of young people there and then sort of this explosive mix with the unemployment mm -hmm. meant that these people had to do something, had to, mm. had to actually um, express themselves in a way and they used social media very effectively to do that, um, to express themselves and, and, and organise and get things done and they were there was a degree of entrepreneurship uh, amongst Egyptians anyway, and they and they did it through uh, online media as well. And there's elections coming up in Egypt. What can we expect to see? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> if I gaze into the crystal ball, I probably won't be able to give you a, a very it's accurate answer. It's dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> um, it? It's really hard to tell. I think yeah. one of the ma major fears I have is that the um, Islamist groups, mm. Islamist parties, and uh, coming off the Muslim Brotherhood, because they've they've had uh, a longer time to be able to establish themselves or have been established sort of as the unofficial opposition mm. and they've put their tentacles out into society in a much broader way uh, in much more depth if you like um, they have an advantage over some of the newer secular parties mm. or even the older parties that had been sort of anemic for for decades uh, and because these new secular parties liberal sort of parties the, the, the people who come from that democracy side of the movement the democratic uh, activists, um, they have a lot of work to do in a very, very short time to set up a political party, set up a policy platform, mm. you know, get out and campaign and, and spread their message. And it's not helped by the fact that they're very fractured uh, anyway. Mm. Um, and so an early election, relatively speaking, uh, would be a great advantage to the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. 
Um, and this is why I think there was a, a postponement, mm -hmm. postponement now to November. Whether that's enough time for these parties to get their act together, I'm not sure. And even yesterday, on fr after Friday prayers, the Islamists came out into Tahrir Square mm. in their tens of thousands as a show of force. And in many ways, really upset the liberal activists mm. because that, that was their movement. They're the ones that sort of toppled Mubarak yeah. and these guys were coming over the top. So there's a lot of tension now yep. between the Islamists, the Salafists and the uh, secular younger, liberal-minded, uh, moderate Egyptians. And how unified is the Islamist movement? It's fractured as well. Uh, and I think that, that is also a weakness they share with the, with the secular parties. The Muslim Brotherhood has been uh, very uh, disciplined and together for 30, 40 years or whatever. And after the revolution, they're, they're splitting off in all sorts of uh, different little parties and uh, people are leaving the party. And the younger Muslim Brotherhood uh, members are forming up their own parties and so on. Um, upset with the constraints put on them by the older generation of, of mm. Muslim brothers who've told them and did tell them not to go out and protest and mm. they ignored them and they went out and did it anyway. So there's a lot of fracturing going on there as well, which one hopes that some of these more moderate strains uh, are ones that would be more accepting of uh, more, more, more of a liberal democracy mm. rather than uh, sort of the extreme radical interpretation mm. of the Muslim Brotherhood. What what sense do you get just finally of what can we expect to see at the end? Can we expect to see liberal democracies emerge in the way that we understand them here in the West? Probably not. Um, uh, liberal democracies, as we know, are more than just elections. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's the separation of church and state or mosque and state in the case of uh, Muslim countries, um, uh, independent judiciary, free press, uh, freedom of expression, association, uh, and, and the uh, different arms of government separated, the executive and the judiciary and the, and the parliament. Um, I think there's a lot of work mm. to get all of those fundamental elements in place in, in, in the Middle East. Um, but I do have some hope because there, there has been, it's not like this is new to the region. Mm. Egypt uh, has had a, par a functioning parliamentary democracy uh, after the revolution against the British in 1919 for about 20 years with a multi-party democracy, a parliamentary Westminster style democracy with a prime minister and all of that, which got shut down during World War II and then, then you had the, the, the revolution by Nasser. So there is some experience of it. Mm. but. You know, it's a hard, long mm. process to establish a genuine democracy. And I'm, I'm fearful that um, if they just have elections and think that's democracy, that, that, that we could actually go backwards. Um, uh, what I do know, though, is that all of the people there, the young people, the, the, the middle-aged people, even the old people, have had enough or had enough mm. of, the, of the previous autocratic regime. And it's going to be different uh, in the future. And let's hope they do work towards... A, a genuine liberal democracy. Mm. Let's hope. Peter Carlyle, thank you so much for joining us here thank at Thank you, Jessica. Thanks.